So let's turn to whether or not marijuana is a risk factor for lung cancer, upper and lower respiratory tract cancer. There's several lines of evidence that would suggest that it may or that it may not. So let's look at the evidence that it may. We already saw that there are carcinogens in marijuana smoke, in fact, in higher concentration than the tobacco. We reported many years ago that from a single marijuana cigarette, one inhale deposits about four times as much tar in the lung as from a single tobacco cigarette because of differences in smoking technique, a longer breath holding time, and differences in rod filtration, marijuana being more loosely packed. And I already showed you these changes, uh, these microscopic changes in the lining cells that can under, of the airway that can undergo malignant change. And we see that various microscopic abnormalities are present in higher concentration in marijuana smokers than non-smokers. These are ones of concern. Nuclear vari variation, nuclear size, mitotic figures, increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, cellular disorganization. And we have some even molecular evidence that uh, using immunohistochemistry, that marijuana uh, smoking is associated with the overexpression of certain protein products of genes that are felt to play an important role in the pathogenesis of cancer, including epidermal growth factor receptor, and, and, and this is a nuclear proliferation factor, KI67. And these are the actual data. And we also have uh, developed a mouse model in which we show that if you implant uh, tumor cells, uh, two different kinds of lung cancer cells in rats, and then you give some rats THC and you give others vehicle, that those given THC have an accelerated rate of development of a growth of these tumors, and that's because of an immunosuppressive effect of THC. Because THC, if you reset those tumors and you ass assay them for certain uh, uh, cytokines, we found an excess of immunosuppressive cytokines, if you block those with monoclonal antibodies, we then no longer see the accelerated growth in, in, um, uh, in uh, uh, cancer. So it seems to uh, have this effect due to its immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive properties. And then lastly, uh, in terms of the evidence for a link, there are several case series that show a much higher proportion of young people who develop head and neck cancer or lung cancer were smokers of marijuana than in the general population. It's very unusual for a young person under the age of 40 to develop head and neck cancer or lung cancer. Yet if they do, uh, at least according to the reports in the literature, a very high proportion of them, as much as almost 100%, 190 and 100 smoke marijuana. But that, those are, case series are uncontrolled. What you really need are population-based epidemiologic studies. And uh, there were three studies that were carried out, one I was a co-author on, that seemed to show a positive association between marijuana and either head and neck cancer or lung cancer. Uh, these could be, and what this relative risk means is the increased risk for developing cancer in association with marijuana controlling for other factors. These studies can, ba can be criticized, I, actually severely, even the study that I was involved in. The control group here was not appropriate it was a clean living control group made up of blood donors and did not and had a low incidence of marijuana smoking. And then these studies from North Africa were confounded by the fact that in North Africa, cannabis is always smoked mixed up with tobacco. So you cannot disentangle the effects of tobacco from those of marijuana. So what about the evidence against a link? Well, there are a number of studies. I thought the Guzman was at present at this particular symposium. Is he? But he's shown some evidence, uh, and others as well, of an anti-tumoral effect of THC <coughs> against a variety of tumors in cell culture systems and animal models, including brain cancer, glioblastoma, prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, probably because THC has anti-proliferative effects. It also has something called a pro-apoptotic effect. It means it leads to premature cell death that prevents these cells, I'm sorry, early cell death prevents these cells from aging so they won't develop malignant change. And they also have an anti-angiogenic effect. You need blood vessels to, for tumors to spread and metastasize. And if you reduce the tendency to, to, to develop these blood vessels, anti-angiogenesis, then uh, that would have an anti-tumoral effect, effect. And this has been shown in a number of studies. Also, the, there are ep well-done epidemiologic studies 
that also failed to show an effect. Uh, so there's a cohort study done in Northern California. This can be criticized because the, 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 the subjects were relatively young and weren't followed for too long a period of time. But these are well done studies of head and neck cancer. One a large study, two earlier. This is Washington State. These are from the UK that absolutely fail to show any increase, in fact, if anything, maybe a slight decrease in the risk in the association between marijuana smoking and head and neck cancer. So because of these conflicting results, we carried out our own study, and I didn't report this the last time I spoke here, and, that, and the purpose of this study was a case control study. It was to see whether or not there's an association between marijuana use and the risk of lung and head and neck cancer. So I'll just, we used the, uh, the catchment area was Los Angeles, it has a huge population, and what we did is we rapidly ascertained all the cases of lung cancer that were diagnosed in the county of Los Angeles over about a four-year period, and all the cases of head and neck cancer, all these different head and neck cancers, and uh, we interviewed as many of these people as possible. There were some refusals because of death, and the patients were too sick to be interviewed, uh, but nonetheless, we're about 40% of these we did interview, and about 80% of those, and we had a thou um, sorry, a high, higher percentage of these, and we had a thousand uh, matched controls match for neighborhood, gender, and age. And we took a detailed history, and this is how you do a case control study. You, you detect the cases, you identify the cases of, let's say, cancer, a particular kind of cancer. You, you then go into the community and you select controls, and then you administer a questionnaire that contains questions about various known or suspected risk factors for cancer. And you see whether there's an imbalance between the cases and the controls using standard statistical techniques such as logistic regression. And so that's what we did. And these are the putative risk factors, occupational exposure, diet, secondhand smoke, uh, not putative, I think it's a known, uh, tobacco smoke, and other, and other factors. And so what did we find? Well, first, if you look at the smoking status of the, case, of the controls versus the cases of cancer, you see right away that there's a much higher percentage of ex and current smokers and certainly most people who develop lung cancer are ex-smokers, not current tobacco smokers, among the cases. If you look at marijuana, then the controls. There's no difference between the ex-smokers and the current smokers in the, uh, in the, among the cases versus the ex or current smokers among the controls. And we also, I thought that we believed that the study was adequately powered because we had 100 individuals among the controls and the cases who smoked more than 10 joint years. That's 10 joints a day, uh, that's one joint a day for 10 years or more. And some of them have smoked much, much more than that. So what did we find? We found absolutely nothing. The, the, in fact, if anything, the risk ratio was on the side of protection, although we can't say there was any significant protective effect because the confidence intervals generally crossed one. And there's no evidence whatsoever of a dose response. And we'll see, usually when there's an association, the more exposure, the greater the response. Nothing was seen. This was true for, this was true for lung cancer, and this was also true for head and neck cancer. Then what about tobacco? Well, look at tobacco. Here we see a marked dose response, a 21-fold increase in risk with more than two packs a day between one and two, almost an eight-fold increase in risk, clear dose response relationship for lung cancer and also a dose response relationship, although the hazard ratio is not as great, for head and neck cancer. So that in summary then, regular marijuana smoking is associated with symptoms of acute and chronic bronchitis. There is evidence of microscopic injury to the cells lining the airways. There is inconsistent evidence of very mild airflow obstruction, which I do not believe leads to the development of clinically significant COPD. Uh, because there is no evidence of any accelerated rate of loss of lung function, which is one of the cardinal features of COPD. And in the large prospectively designed population-based study, we did not observe, and this is, I think, the best study yet done, we did not, and the largest, we did not observe a positive association of marijuana use, even heavy long-term use, with either lung or head and neck cancer. We controlled for as many confounders as possible. Instead, in contrast, we've confirmed the very strong dose-dependent relations effect of tobacco on cancer. So I thank you for your uh, attention.